Dr. Sutton, you wrote three series of books while you were a research fellow at the Hoover Institute. Can you give me basically the background of the content of these series? Yes, the, uh, the uh, series I wrote at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University concerned the transfers of Western technology to the Soviet Union and essentially comprised uh, three individual books. Each book covers a period of time s from, since 1917. And then you wrote a second series of books on Wall Street. Yes, uh, these were trade books. Uh, in other words, they're, they're not academic books. They're written for the general public. Uh, they concerned the uh, build-up of the three types of socialism, uh, Bolshevik socialism in Russia, um, what we might call welfare socialism in the United States, and uh, Hitlerian or national socialism. And each book examines the financing and the contributions made by Wall Street by international bankers to, that, to the development of that specific form of socialism. Now, in your research and analysis, and your efforts to bring out the facts about what was going on in our society, did you encounter any effort to discourage you, to prevent you from bringing out the background of America's involvement in the financing of international communism? Yes, very definitely. Um, for example, uh, when I was at the Hoover Institution uh, in 1972, I went to Miami Beach to give some testimony before the um, Republican National Committee. And uh, although a congressman had hand-delivered to the wire services this testimony, which was later printed, uh, the wire services refused to transmit it to the newspapers. Then when I got back to the Hoover Institution um, in California, um, I was called into the office of the director and uh, I was uh, told in no uncertain terms not to make any more speeches like that and that this information should not be made public. This was the information that we were uh, giving uh, the, at, the Soviet Union the technology to develop its war potential? Oh yes, at that time we were, in, we, we were in Vietnam and as you know the Soviets were supplying the North Vietnamese. This was 1972? 1972, yes. And uh, for example, I knew that the Gorky plant, which was built by the Ford Motor Company, but the Gorky plant in Russia produces the gas a series of vehicles. The gas vehicles had been seen on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We were supplying equipment to the Gorky plant in the middle of the Vietnamese war and these trucks were being used to carry ammunition supplies, which were killing Americans. Now, I thought this was morally wrong, and I said so in Miami Beach and at the Hoover Institution. And it was this type of information uh, that was suppressed. And so what eventually happened as far as your activities at the Hoover Institution were concerned? Well, I didn't pay much heed to the warnings. I, I published a book called National Suicide in the following year, which um, summarized our assistance to uh, the Soviets, our military assistance to the Soviets. And when that book came out, the grain, again, there was great pressure to stop the book. Uh, both on, there was pressure on both the publishers and me personally. And uh, I felt I couldn't take this. And a few years later, I just left the Hoover Institution. And since 1975, I've been an independent author without any ties whatsoever. Let's go a little bit into the background of the financing of the German war machine that we fought in the period 1941 to 1945. Could we start, first of all, with the original financing of Hitler between 1922 and 1923, uh, 1923 when he was first making his effort to come into prominence in Germany? The uh, original financing of Hitler, that's in the years 1922, came only partly from Germany. Uh, one of the most prominent Americans concerned with financing Hitler was uh, Henry Ford. In fact, Henry Ford received a medal in 1938 for his assistance to the early Nazi party. Then, of course, Hitler had his attempted push in uh, 1923. He went to jail, and then we begin another era in the rise of Hitler. Right, and of course, he eventually came to power in 1933 uh, by the electoral process. What about the financing of Hitler's um, electoral activities in 1933? But this, this I can trace, I have traced it very exactly. I discovered uh, amongst the Nuremberg records a series of bank transfer slips um, to the Delbruck Schickler Bank in Berlin to an account which was under the control of Rudolf Hess. And this was the fund that was used to finance Hitler's access to power in March 1973. And amongst the corporations, that transferred money to Hitler, I find not only R.G. Farben, which is, which is quite widely known, but also uh, German General Electric, AEG, 
which is under, under the control of General Electric in the United States, or was at that time, and com uh, companies like Osram and... Um, now, what was the tie-in between Osram and General Electric? The tie-in was a share tie-in. International General Electric in the United States had controlling interest in German General Electric and also through share interlocks, uh, a controlling interest in Osram in, in Germany. So then we have Ford and we have General Electric helping to finance Adolf Hitler's mm -hmm. rise to power. Mm -hmm. Were any other large American corporations involved? Oh, very definitely. Um, Standard Oil, through its uh, technical association with IG Farben, um, uh, for example, uh, Germany could not have gone to war in 1939 without uh, tetraethyl. You need tetraethyl to raise the octane value of aviation gasoline. Germany had no means of doing that. This was developed in the, um, in the ethyl uh, laboratories in the United States and transferred uh, to the Germans. Uh, Standard Oil came up with the hydrogenation idea, which was very essential for Germany in the 1930s because the, uh, to raise the quality of its gasoline for aviation purposes. This was transferred to the Nazis. And uh, ITT, for example, International Telephone and Telegraph, uh, was very intimately associated with the Nazis uh, through Dr. Schroeder, who was head of the um, ITT subsidiaries in uh, Germany. And ITT controlled companies which made not only um, um, electrical instruments, but also the Fock Wolf plant, which made um, airplanes, uh, fighter airplanes. So what you're suggesting then is that American corporations were helping to finance the German industry that was building up the war potential? American corporations, only a few, not many, financed Hitler through their subsidiaries. They transferred technology. They transferred material assistance, for example, stocks of tetraethyl before the Germans could manufacture it under the joint manufacturing agreement with the United States. And also they financed this. For example, Standard Oil financed in 1933 the development of the um, gasoline industry in uh, Germany, which was needed to fight World War II. And that's a very interesting point. Could you go a little bit into the background of where Germany got its oil? to fight the Second World War, because certainly Germany doesn't have oil resources. Germany does not have oil resources, that's true. It uh, used in World War II synthetic oil, which it, did, uh, which it uh, got from coal. And the basic technical processes for the development of oil from coal came from the United States, from uh, essentially from the Standard Oil Laboratories, which had this technical assistance agreement with IG Farben. And of course, IG Farben contributed uh, something like 60% of the explosives needed um, by the German Wehrmacht, uh, probably about 40-50% of the gasoline needed by the Wehrmacht and by the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. And was there a definite airlock between IG Farben and Standard Oil? The uh, interlock was at the technical level the exchange of patents. It was through a financial technical assistance agreement. There were other interlocks with the United States uh, through a uh, subsidiary, IG Farben, um, in the United States. But with Standard Oil, the interlocks were at the technical and financial level. And is it a fact, it's been stated, that there were members of the board of directors of Standard Oil who were also on the board of directors of American IG Farben? Yes, uh, Walter Teagle is one name that comes to mind. And well, there were several, there were several directors. Was there an interlock with Ford between IG Farben and uh, American IG Farben and the Ford Motor Company? Um, not that I can recall, not offhand. Not offhand. So basically, what we're seeing then is American industry helping to provide the technology, helping to f provide the finance, helping to provide the material that is going to allow Hitler to create his war machine. Yes, that is correct. That is correct. Now, in your book, Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, you talked about the bombing patterns during the Second World War and the fact that it was amazing that there were certain factories that were not bombed, whereas the majority of the German factories were decimated, German-owned factories. There were certain factories that tied into this interlock we've already alluded to mm -hmm. that for some strange reason seemed to escape the devastation of our saturation bombing. In, in World War II, the uh, German uh, electrical industry 
was or should have been a prime target for Western bombing. But in practice, uh, the German General Electric plants were not bombed. Uh, of the ten major plants, not one was bombed, and a half a dozen others had trifling damage, broken windows, that kind of thing. So what we have here is a very interesting case of an industry which should have been bombed in World War II, but was not bombed, and yet we have American ownership, which raises a certain amount of suspicion as to why it was not bombed. But as far as the German-owned electrical companies, did they um, undergo a rather heavy bombing? I took a look at that. The Siemens plant, for example, uh, they were bombed. There's no question. But uh, the industry was not targeted as a general target. So Siemens, for example, was not bombed as heavily as, say, um, uh, tank plants or uh, aviation plants, that kind of thing. You mentioned the Ford plant in Cologne. Was yeah. this a prime military target? The Ford plant in Cologne should have been a prime military target. For example, the British Air Force, the Royal Air Force, did bomb the Ford plant at Poissy in France. But the Ford plant in Cologne, which was the by far the largest Ford plant in Germany, was not bombed in World War II. But did our military planners intend to bomb it? In other words, was it on the aiming report? Well, uh, I did look at the aiming reports for the, uh, the plants in Cologne. Uh, Ford was known about. It, they knew that it was producing equipment for the Wehrmacht. Uh, but it was not bombed. It was scheduled as a target, but it was not bombed. So somewhere along the line, as far as the planning was concerned, the name of uh, the Ford Motor Plant in Cologne was deleted, and yet the city of Cologne itself was totally decimated. The city of Cologne was decimated, uh, as of course many other cities in Germany were decimated, but somewhere along the line, um, something happened. I suspect it was in the aiming committees, and Without question, orders were sent out not to bomb uh, certain targets, even though these were prime military targets. And that's rather reminiscent of some of the orders that went out during the Korean War, some of the orders that went out during the Vietnamese War to leave specific targets within the enemy's domain untouched by our strategic bombing. I understand that was so, although I had not investigated it. Now, in your book, Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, there was one very interesting section about a special fund that Heinrich Himmler had and the funneling of money from German corporations into this fund even up into the years 1943 and 1944 and many of these corporations had strong ties into the American corporations, into their, the American parent corporations. Could you tell us a little bit about the Kepler Fund? The Kepler Fund was also known as the Conto S Fund. It was uh, what we might call Heinrich Himmler's personal slush fund. He used it for his own personal projects. And um, what amazed me was both in 1933 and in 1944, the two days, uh, the, the two years for which I examined the records, um, over half the funds came from American corporations. For example, in 1933, ITT, uh, Standard Oil, General Electric, and, uh, and possibly Osram were contributors. Even in 1944, in the middle of World War II, we find that ITT was funneling funds to Heinrich Himmler's, fu uh, Heinrich Himmler's fund through um, Schroeder, who was the chairman of the uh, ITT subsidiaries in Germany. We also find that uh, Depark, the um, standard oil subsidiary in uh, Germany, was financing Heinrich Himmler, and this was in the middle of World War II. Now, were these facts ever brought out at the Nuremberg hearings? They were never brought out at the Nuremberg hearings, although the documents do exist within the uh, within the files, within the records. They have not been published, as far as I know. And you actually had access to these records? Yes, there's some 400 tons of these records available. And uh, many of them were at the Hoover Institution, or copies were at the Hoover Institution, and that's where I found the original documentation. I think it's a tragic part of our history when the American public doesn't realize the interplay then between great American corporations and the financing, the funding of the Nazi movement. Now, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the Nuremberg trials, because at the Nuremberg trials, the Nazis, the Nazi war criminals, the Nazi generals were, hold, were held specifically guilty for what transpired. Were there any Americans um, involved? Were any Americans um, indicted? Were any Americans convicted as far as the financing of the Nazi war movement? Uh, very definitely not. Uh, I looked at the criteria 
for um, what we might call war, war crimes under the Nuremberg uh, Tribunal. And there's no question in my mind that certain Americans well fitted the criteria which required indictment and trial. But no Americans were ever brought to trial. Do you think there was any conscious effort to conceal this fact? both from the Nuremberg War Tribunal and from the American public? Well, it was a conscious effort in the fact that uh, these businessmen were very uh, prominent in uh, stating in 1946 that they had no knowledge of what Hitler was doing, and yet they were intimately involved with the build-up with Hitler. I suspect that this was not published in the media at the time, although I've not checked that. But certainly the, the role of American corporations and American businessmen in aiding Hitler has not been published. Now what about the actual financing, what about the loans from large American banks, from large British banks, to Hitler's government in that period between 1933 and 1939 when Hitler was preparing for war? Well you've got to go back a little earlier and look at what are known as the uh, young loans, which were very important because I think they brought about the economic collapse of Germany in 1933. That was the young plan. But this was Owen Young, who was of course chairman of General Electric. Uh, here, we, here we got a man who actually made the loans as an officer of the United States government, which brought about the collapse of Germany in 1933, enabling Hitler to take over. And then subsequent to 1933, you get a series of loans. Um, uh, a very good one is Standard Oil, which um, loans several million dollars, at least, to Germany to build up its um, aviation gasoline facilities. And uh, there are other examples. Fine. Well, I'd like to get a little bit into the background of the financing of Bolshevism, because I think this is vitally important. And we can go back to the period after the uh, Second Revolution, which was in October or November of 1917. The initial financing of Lenin's movement, how did it tie into the American corporations? Was there any American involvement in that period between 1917 and 1918 when Bolshevism was just beginning to get a foothold in Russia? Yes, there were several uh, incidents. The most important is one involving Colonel uh, William Boyce Thompson, who was the largest shareholder in the Chase Bank, which of course today is Chase Manhattan Bank. And um, I published in one of my books a, uh, a copy of a cablegram which transferred funds from New York to Petrograd in December 1917, one million dollars to be precise, and uh, Colonel Thompson made the statement later that this one million dollars was given to the Bolsheviks uh, to, to consolidate, that they had just begun to take over Russia, they only controlled Moscow and Petrograd at that time to aid the, um, the control that the Bolsheviks were extending in Russia. This is a very clear case. One million dollars, American funds, transferred through an American Wall Street intermediary to the Bolsheviks. And didn't you publish that uh, document here in Wall Street and the Rise of Bolshevism? I published two, uh, two statements. One is a copy of the cablegram and the other is a copy of the news clip of the statement made by Colonel Thompson at that time that he had given, made his contribution. Now, why would an American capitalist, an American financier, help to aid Bolshevism? The only answer, and of course this puzzled me for years, you know, why? Why? Because we understand there to be an opposition. And the only answer I can come to is one of captive markets. The United States did not want another United States in the world. And of course, if you look at the world map, uh, Russia is uh, two or three times larger than the United States. Imagine this as another United States, as another competitor to the United States. What the United States wanted, or Wall Street wanted, was a captive market. And of course, socialism is a captive market because my earlier studies at Stanford University had brought out the fact that a socialist system cannot innovate. It's got to import innovation and technology from the West. And so I think the aim behind this was to encourage the development of Marxism and other, social, other types of socialism because this would give these Wall Street bankers control of a world market, a captive market. At the end of the First World War, Russia was devastated by famine, and America sent a relief mission. It was the Hoover mission. Do you know any of the facts surrounding the uh, activities of the Hoover Commission? Well, there's no question that in 1922-1923, uh, Russia was finished. Uh, industrial output was perhaps uh, 8 or 10 percent 
of uh, 1913 figures, and people were starving by the hundreds of thousands. And the Hoover mission was organized, of course, to send aid uh, to Russia. Uh, but most of the aid went to the Bolsheviks, who controlled um, really quite a small part of Russia at that time. Only a very small part of the aid went to uh, the white Russians or to the Far East. And then after 1922-1923, Lenin instituted something known as the New Economic Policy, or this series of five-year plans. Can you tell us about the five-year plans and the part that the major American corporations, major world corporations, played in building up the Soviet Union? Well, there are two separate um, phases here. The, the new, econ new Economic Policy was uh, started in 1923 by Lenin, and I found, and I published this in my first book from Stanford, that every single Russian industry was rebuilt or restarted by foreign corporations, mostly German, British, French, and American. By 1928, uh, Russia was back to approximately its 1913 um, in industrial output. And at that point, uh, she began to think of these grandiose five-year plans. And in 1928, Gosplan, which is the, the uh, Russian Government Planning Commission, actually designed an initial five-year plan, but this was thrown out, it was in inadequate, and American corporations were built in, uh, were, were brought into Russia. And the first five-year plan and the second five-year plan were actually designed in the United States by American corporations. And what were these corporations? Which ones specifically were involved? In the design of the um, first first five-year plan was by a corporation probably not known to most Americans, Albert Kahn. But Albert Kahn was uh, the foremost industrial architect in the United States. And Albert Kahn laid out uh, the basics of the first five-year plan for the Soviets. And then we find, again, the same corporations involved with the construction of the plants, International General Electric, certainly, uh, DuPont, Ford Motor, Hercules Motor, uh, Curtis Wright in aircraft engines, and even some corporations which today were forgotten about, like Valti and uh, Chance Vought. These were aircraft manufacturers at that time. And so American corporations came in and they built the first five-year plan. But what was important, the Soviets then copied these plans, and this accounts for the tremendous Russian output. They took this initial equipment, and they multiplied it, they copied it by the hundred. By the now, how about Ford Motor Company? Did they play a part in the building up of the Soviet potential? Uh, very definitely. Uh, Ford Motor Company built the Gorky plant, and the Gorky plant produces uh, the GAZ series of vehicles, that's G-A-Z, and these are trucks and uh, some automobiles. And uh, right from the early 1930s, you find that the GAZ plant has had military potential, and Ford knew that when it went in and built the Gorky plant. And we know it because I found statements to this effect within the State Department files. Sometimes we hear the name Averill Harriman. Did he play a part in building up the Soviet technology? Uh, very definitely. In fact, Averill Harriman uh, came out of the Soviet Union um, financially uh, at a profit. He took over the Georgian manganese concession in the early 1920s got this back on his feet for the Soviets, and manganese um, became a prime export for the Soviets, and so they were able to sell this abroad, get foreign exchange, which financed their industrialization. And uh, then they uh, bought out um, Harriman about 1929, and Abel Harriman uh, received his compensation $1 million more than he put in in the first place. How about Armand Hammer of Occidental Petroleum? Armand Hammer is a very interesting example. Um, Armand Hammer received the first foreign concession in 1922. Uh, in asbestos in the Ural Mountains. And uh, he also conducted for the Soviets a number of other enterprises, right down to pens and pencil manufacturing, for example. But Armand Hammer is interesting because his father, although Armand Hammer today is chairman of Occidental Petroleum Corporation, his father was Julius Hammer, who in 1919 was Secretary General of the Communist Party USA, which emphasizes the argument I made throughout my books, that at the top level, there's no difference between your top communist and your top capitalist, the interlink. You've got Armand Hammer, chairman of Occidental Petroleum. His father was secretary of the Communist Party USA in 1919. So it's basically a power grab. It's a power grab, an international power grab. 
Now, during the Second World War, why Russia was pretty well decimated once again by German forces. What part did the American Unleashed program play in building up Russia's industrial capacity after the Second World War? Well, lend lease built up Russia's capacity, modernized it, and expanded it during World War II. And there was some continuation all the way through perhaps to 1948-1949. There was a program after lend lease, which was supposed to be restricted to foodstuffs and industrial materials, but in effect, uh, I checked the records in the warehouses in Suitland, Maryland, I find that even after World War II, and this was against the intent of Congress, I suspect, there was a massive transfer of the latest industrial equipment to the Soviet Union under the so-called lend lease program. Now, in 1948, there was a fascinating book came out by Major uh, Racy Jordan in which he talked about American aid to the communists as far as their ability to build nuclear weapons. Did you ever have an opportunity of verifying the facts that we had given them the heavy water, we'd given them the wherewithal to build their atomic weapons? Well, as part of the work I was doing um, at Stanford, I did investigate the, uh, the um, shipping documents for land lease and I took a sample of these documents and I checked them against Major Jordan and uh, broadly uh, Major Jordan was correct within say about five percent and Major Jordan of course made the charge that we had shipped materials to the Soviets 1944-1945 which were later used in their atomic program there is no doubt he is correct uh, we shipped heavy water, which is essential, but we shipped other items which are perhaps less obvious to the layman. We shipped, for example, aluminum tubes, and aluminum tubes are essential for atomic energy development. We shipped graphite, and graphite is another essential component. So generally, as far as I could check, and I checked the original government land lease document, General uh, Major Jordan was correct. Now, as the years have gone by, of course, we see a growing Soviet nuclear threat. The Soviets now have MIRV missiles. Mm -hmm. Can you get a little of the background on how the Soviet Union, which really didn't have the technology to develop those MIRV missiles that threaten our cities today, how were they able to develop the MIRV capacity? Well, you've got to go back and look at how the Russians were able to develop a rocket, space technology anyway. What they did after World War II was American forces were held back for a while while the Soviets occupied East Germany. They stripped East Germany. They took back the latest of the V-2 rocket technology from Pinamunda and other places. And the V-2 became the basis of the uh, Russian space technology. Now, if you skip the inter 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 intervening years, you will find when you come to the early uh, 1970s that the Russians did not have the capability to move their missiles. And in particular, they lacked the ability to produce the very precision, micro-miniature ball bearings that are needed for the control systems. There was only one company in the world, Brian Chuck and Grinder, which could make the machinery, which machines the races which, within which these ball bearings run. And without those races, you just cannot make uh, moved missiles in any quantity. You can make one off, but not in quantity. Brian Chuck and Grinder was allowed to ship to the Soviet Union 45 of the mach these machines at a time when we only had 33 in the United States. But wasn't there any objection to doing this? I objected at Miami Beach in 1972. Other people objected, but the objections were squashed. And predominantly at fault here is uh, Henry Kissinger and the incoming administration, the incoming Nixon administration. The, this was known, um, I'm sure it was known in DOD. If I knew it, then certainly DOD know, knew it. But the objections were squashed, and there was, a, uh, there was suppression of the information. And so once again, we see America building up the military capacity, the m nuclear threat from the Soviet Union. Well, this goes, you know, when you talk about moving of missiles, you're talking about a quantum jump in your military technology. Now, I'm not a military man, but to me, the ability to do that is a, um, is a massive leap forward. And we enabled them to do it, and we did it knowingly and deliberately. During the Vietnamese War, the Soviet Union and the Eastern European satellites were the primary suppliers of war materials to the North Vietnamese who were killing American boys in South Vietnam. Would you comment on our aid and trade with the Soviet Union and with the Eastern European satellites during that period of time? Well, there's no question that uh, the Soviets were the prime suppliers of military equipment and supplies to the North Vietnamese. Let me give you an example. 
Um, the American pilots, as they flew over the Ho Chi Minh Trail, described the trucks that they were seeing as American trucks. Well, they were American trucks because they came from the Gorky plant, and Gorky was built by Henry Ford. And so you have the situation where um, we were, in effect, supplying both sides in the Vietnamese War. But the trucks were being built by the Soviet Union. However, were they getting any materials from the United States to help build those trucks? Yes, um, in the early 1970s. I know specifically of shipments of equipment into the Gorky plant while the war was going on, which in effect were aiding the Soviets to build more trucks to be used by the, by the North Vietnamese. How about loans? Was America extending loans to the Soviet Union during this period when they were the primary financiers of the North Vietnamese? Yes. Uh, beginning about 1970, uh, there was a massive uh, grant of loans to the Soviet Union. I'd say by about 1976, it must have totaled perhaps $40, million, $40 billion outstanding. And so this, of course, uh, these loans were used to enable the Soviet Union to purchase uh, um, industrial equipment in the United States, and this industrial equipment was used to manufacture, in part, military supplies which were used against us in Vietnam. How about Russian shipping that was being used to ferry supplies to North Vietnam? Mm, shipping is a very interesting example because the Soviets published a shipping register about uh, 6,000 ships, and I analyzed every one of these ships, uh, both the origin of the technology of the ship itself, the hull, and the engine. Most of them are marine diesel engines. And I find that 60% of the Soviet uh, merchant marine, which of course has military usefulness, 60% was built aboard. Only 40% in the Soviet Union, and that largely to Western design. But when you come to marine diesel engines, you find something really fascinating. You find that 80% of the marine diesel engines in Soviet merchant ships are Western engines, uh, Burmeister and Wayne of Copenhagen, Copenhagen Sulzer of Switzerland, Fiat of Italy, because that name has come up before. But the other 20% of marine diesel engines built in the Soviet Union are built to Western design under technical assistance contracts from Sulzer and uh, Burmeister and Wayne. So in effect, there could be no Soviet merchant marine without assistance from the West. How about the building of the Kama River plant? Kama River was built in the late 1960s, early 1970s. The basic design the contract was let to the um, Italian firm of Fiat. Uh, Giovanni Agnelli is the chairman of the board. And uh, this is important because Agnelli is tied in with Chase Manhattan Bank. He's on the uh, International Advisory Committee of Chase Manhattan. Uh, what caught my attention was that Fiat does not manufacture automobile manufacturing equipment. All the Fiat plants in Italy are contain American equipment. And what I found was that the equipment was coming, perhaps about 60-70% of it, from the United States, from major automobile equipment suppliers in the United States. I think the, it was known as the Fiat plant as a cover um, to perhaps divert attention from the fact that during the Vietnamese War, we were building the largest plant in the world. It covers 36 square miles. We were building for the Soviets with American equipment, the largest plant in the world. And so it was called the Italian Fiat plant, and I think this was a blind. And so they were building their trucks and armored personnel carriers and other things that could be used then for warfare in South Vietnam? We knew that the Karma plant had military potential. In 1972, I wrote it in National Suicide. In, um, I said as much in Miami Beach in 1972. This plant has military potential. It can produce military vehicles. We knew it. And, of course, today in Afghanistan, we find that the Karma vehicles that are, are there in Afghanistan today from the Karma plant built by American and Italian companies. And it was after you brought out this information that efforts were made to suppress your book, National Suicide, yes. and your other studies? Yes, because I was bringing out the fact that the Karma River plant had military potential, that we were moving the missiles with the Bryant uh, chucking grinder equipment, and, of course, other facts along these lines. And what sort of pressure was brought to bear upon you? What sort of pressure was brought to bear upon the publisher of your book, National Suicide? Uh, the, uh, there was pressure on the publisher uh, to prevent publication, to stop publication. Uh, he refused to do so. There's pressure brought upon me first to withdraw the book, and then a rather um, deceitful sort of pressure. It was claimed at the Hoover Institution that I had uh, plagiarized Volume 3 
of my Western Technology series, which was being published by Stanford University. Well, firstly, I challenged them to point out the plagiarization, and nobody could find even two sentences that matched up. But then I pointed out that I cannot plagiarize my own work. I hold the copyright on both books, and nowhere in the world can I plagiarize myself. That's a logical impossibility. And then, gradually, it built up over the following years uh, that my research was uh, perhaps going a little out of what was um, perhaps required or welcome would be a better word, and it should be confined within more narrow uh, boundaries. And at that point in 1975, I left the Hoover Institution, and since then I've become uh, an independent author, and I can publish what I want to publish. Do you know of any other instances where efforts were made to suppress publication of books through the Hoover Institute? I know one example, uh, one I was personally aware of, and that uh, was Julius Epstein's book on Operation Cube Hall, which is a very important book uh, on the treatment of Russian prisoners of war in Germany after World War II. This book was in manuscript for several years, and he was not allowed to publish it. I, I heard that firsthand from Julius. Right, and eventually it was, of course, brought out. It was at, uh, at a, uh, a later point. Now, another example I can give is my own um, Western Technology series. The third volume of that was held in galleys for one year. Now, it costs a lot of money to hold a book in galleys, because when a book is in galleys, you want to get it out on the market to start recouping your investment. That book was held in galleys for one year, because it was not politically um, wise or acceptable to publish it at that time, even though it was an academic book. Now, you've done some fascinating studies on the Trilateral Commission. Can you tell us about the Trilateral Commission? The Trilateral Commission uh, is a private organization founded by David Rockefeller in 1973. It was essentially financed by um, Rockefeller and some of the foundations, Kettering Foundation, Danforth Foundation, Ford Foundation. Uh, Ford Foundation was a very major contributor. And uh, the uh, stated objective is to encourage discussion amongst what they call the trilateral regions. I should point out that of the 300 members, one-third come from the United States, one-third from Japan, and one-third from Europe. But in effect, I find that the actions of the Trilateral Commission are very much self-interested on the part of the international banking community in New York. Now, as far as the Trilateral Commission's influence on the American government is concerned, it's been said that the, there is a very excessive representation of the Trilateral Commission in Jimmy Carter's cabinet and in Jimmy Carter's administration. Well, excessive is rather a, an understatement, I think. There's some 200 million people in the United States. There are only 77 trilateral members who are American. Out of that 77, I count it no fewer than 18 trilateralists. That's about, about one-third of the trilateral American trilateral contingent turns up in the Carter administration. Uh, Mr. Carter himself is a trilateral, Mr. Mondale, Mr. Brown, Mr. Vance, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Brown, Secretary of Defense. In other words, they occupy all the senior cabinet and sub-cabinet posts. In fact, there's some key committees, intelligence and defense committees, which are only comprised of trilaterals. So here you've got 77 Americans selected by one man, David Rockefeller, who's chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, and we find that they turn up in the key controlling positions in Washington under the Carter administration. And would this suggest to you that perhaps we do not select the uh, government, that it is selected by these people who work behind the scenes? You can come to no other conclusion. If you look today at who's running for office, you find Mr. Bush is a trilateral. You find Mr. Anderson is a trilateral. Mr. Carter is a trilateral. We find articles appearing in Newsweek magazine, Time magazine, U.S. News and World Report, many of the major media telling us there's really nothing to be concerned about from the Trilateral Commission. Is there any interlock between the Trilateral Commission and the major media in the United States? Yes, there is an interlock, um, particularly in the um, news media. For example, the uh, Chicago Sun-Times, the executive editor there, uh, James Hoogie is uh, a trilateral. You'll find uh, Sol Linowitz is a director of Time magazine. And I think, yes, um, Schacht, uh, Henry Schacht is a director of CBS. So there very definitely is an interlock between the trilaterals and the media. And perhaps this is the reason, then, that they rather play down the influence of the Trilateral Commission on contemporary American government. Yes, I had a computer survey made of um, all articles that have been printed on the Trilateral Commission since 1973, I could find worldwide only 73 articles. 
Now, what's the relationship between the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations? Uh, well, of course, the Council on Foreign Relations is a much older organization founded in 1920. I did a study in which I compared uh, trilaterals with or without membership in the CFR, Council on Foreign Relations. I find there's something over 50% overlap.